Okay, our second best, best paper award goes to Automating Resolution is NP Hard by Albert Atzerias and Moritz Mueller, and Albert will give the talk. Is this the second best paper? <laughs> I mean, the, the, sorry. The, these awards are all, of course, equal. There's no distinguishing between these three papers. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so let me start with the timeline of the history of the satisfiability problem and resolution as a method for solving the satisfiability problem. So it all starts with the Davis Putnam procedure in 1960. This was a journal of the ACM paper. And uh, so a few years later, Robinson realized that this procedure can be thought as a proof system and therefore he formalized uh, resolution the way we understand it today. And in 1971, uh, Steve Cook proved that uh, SAT is NP-complete in his famous paper on uh, the complexity of theorem proving procedures. And one of the things he asked in that paper is whether uh, there are hard examples for Davis Putnam procedure, uh, besides proving that SAT is NP-complete. And that problem was solved uh, 15 years later by Haken's theorem, which showed that uh, the pigeonhole principle, when you want to uh, when you formulate it as a propositional uh, tautology, it's going to be hard for resolution, and therefore it's also going to be hard for Davis Putnam because resolution is an abstraction of the Davis Putnam procedure. So this was uh, up to the 80s. Let's uh, fast forward to the 2000s, and so I'm skipping many uh, progress in resolution, but uh, what happened in 2001 was a little weird in the sense that uh, on the one hand, there were people who are trying to build actual systems that were uh, working in practice quite well. And there is this 2001 breakthrough, the Chaff implementation, as it's called, where it was given the first evidence, so to speak, that uh, finding proofs in resolution was relatively easy. And this was happening to be easy for instances in real life, in industry, and also for real benchmarks. But at the same time, theoreticians at the bottom of the slide uh, proved that, in fact, they gave the first evidence that the proof search problem for resolution has to be hard in, in a proof theoretic sense, in a, in a complexity theoretic sense. So the progress didn't stop here in the practical side. So by 2016, people were solving SAT instances in somewhat a routine way until finally, and in this amazing breakthrough came up where people were able to solve uh, some Ramsey theory problems uh, giving and finding proofs that were ab absolutely huge, 200 terabytes of uh, resolution proof. So you can have to imagine that this is a completely huge proof. So the situation seems to be then that the proofs is, are relatively easy to find in practice, but we also have some evidence that they are hard. So let's see what else can we say. So let me now define precisely what uh, resolution is and what the main result is. So we have, uh, just to set the notation, we have variables x1 to xn, the negations not x1 to not xn, and we make clauses with these literals, and CNF formulas are just conjunctions of these clauses. And here's an example. Now, resolution is a way to derive new clauses from old clauses. If you know that uh, the clause c or x is true, and you also know that d or not x is true, then by force, C or D has to be true because X cannot be true and false at the same time. So this extremely simple rule is all you need if you want to derive any clause that follows logically from the given clauses that you have. So in the sense, a resolution rule is a complete way to producing all the consequences. So this is this simple. And with this, we can produce uh, proofs uh, in the way you can imagine. You have a CNF that you want to refute. You have the clauses C1 to CN. And then you produce uh, new clauses by resolution. So the first one, D1, is going to be, by force, is going to be one of the initial clauses. And then each new clause is going to follow from two previous clauses, the left premise and the right premise. And this structure is sometimes called the proof graph of uh, the proof graph of the proof. And we call it a refutation if the last clause is the empty clause, which is, of course, unsatisfiable, and therefore we proved that the original formula could not be satisfiable. Now, uh, there are many measures of resolution proofs, and the one that we're going to focus on is, is the length of the proof, which is just the number of clauses that uh, is produced. And then the resolution complexity of the formula is going to be the length 
of the shortest refutation, one of the shortest refutations. It's not necessarily unique, of course. And it's not hard to see that the shortest proof is always going to be at most exponential in the number of variables. All right, so this is the definition of the, uh, of the proof system. And now the proof search problem for resolution is this uh, simple problem where you're given a CNF formula that it's promised to be unsatisfiable, and your task is to find a resolution refutation. Now, a very simple observation is that by Hacken's theorem, this cannot be any better than exponential for the simple reason that the output has to be exponential. But is there something more intelligent that we can say here? And in fact, here is uh, one way to formulate a better question. So, for example, imagine for some reason, some application dependent uh, scenario, you know that your proof, your, your formula has a short proof. Can we then find this proof? Okay? So given uh, that we have short proofs, can we find them? Another way to put it, and it's actually an equivalent way to state it, is could we solve the problem not in time polynomial in the size of the formula, but in time polynomial in the size of the shortest proof? So that's question two. And in that case, this is the formal definition of when we say that the resolution is automatable or automatized. So people say automatizable, and that's the way I'm gonna say it myself. So we say that resolution is automatizable in polynomial time if the problem in Q2 can be done in polynomial time or quasi-polynomial time, obviously it would mean uh, that you can do it in quasi-polynomial time in the length of the shortest proof. All right, so this is the definition. And now we can state the main results. We can show that resolution is not automatizable in polynomial time unless P equals NP. So this is now the strongest possible uh, mm, evidence that uh, resolution is not automatizable. Notice that the assumption that P is different from NP is, uh, is optimal, because if P happened to be equal to NP, then you can actually automatize, right? So it's an even only if, and therefore the assumption is completely optimal. Now you may wonder what happens if you assume something stronger like the exponential time hypothesis. In that case, we can show that uh, resolution is not automatizable in sub-exponential time. In fact, we show more than this. We show, and this is the construction. Uh, so you, when you want to show that something is NP-hard, you want to do a reduction. And in this case, we do a gap-creating uh, reduction where we start with a formula F and we produce another formula G. Both are CNFs. In such a way that if you start with satisfiable formula, then you get something that has a small proof, almost linear in the size of the formula. And in the case that it's unsatisfiable, F, uh, what you get is something that doesn't have uh, sub-exponential proofs. So from now on, these two quantities, I'm going to refer to them as small and big, because it's not really important what they are. But one thing to notice is that this implies the, the main result, because if we could find short proofs in polynomial time, then we would be able to tell apart the first case from the second case, and therefore to tell apart satisfiable from unsatisfiable formulas. But this also means that uh, the problem of uh, computing the minimum resolution proof length um, is not approximable because you have created this huge gap. So you cannot approximate it within sub-exponential error uh, in polynomial time unless P equals NP. So this is a very strong inapproximability result for, for the minimum resolution proof length. All right, so these are the st statements of the results. And now I want to tell you a little bit the history of the problem in order to appreciate uh, so what was known and, and so what's the state of the art. Now the history of the problem is uh, summarized in some positive and some negative results. And these uh, positive and negative results will come from considering stronger and weaker proof systems. So this is a, uh, the densest slide I have. So let me tell you a little bit. Uh, so what you see here is the resolution rule. But instead of a literal, we have a formula A, an arbitrary formula A. This is sometimes called the cut rule. So in general, you could imagine this resolution rule or the cut rule applied not to literals but to arbitrary formulas. And when you do this, you get a proof system that is stronger. And uh, this is, gives you a hierarchy of proof systems very much in the way of uh, we do in circuit complexity, where if you allow, for example, arbitrary circuits as formulas, then you get what's known as extended Frege. If you allow formulas, then you get Frege. Uh, TC0 Frege would be bounded depth formulas with threshold gates, and so on. 
Now, resolution stands uh, somewhere there where you have the only allowed formulas are clauses. And now you may wonder how do you, can you get something weaker than resolution? What is weaker than clauses? Well, what you do in that case is uh, you restrict the shape of the proof graph. Remember, the proof graph is this structure that the proof has. And when you say that the proof is a, if the proof is a tree, then we call it a tree-like resolution. All right, so this is a well-studied hierarchy of proof systems. And let's start now with the positive results that were known. So if you focus on tree-like resolution, it so happened that there was a quasi-polynomial time automatization algorithm. And uh, so, so this is quite surprising. But the intuition is, goes back to the fact that when you think of tree-like proofs, then there is an equivalent way of seeing such proofs as decision trees. And once you have decision trees, then you can apply methods of divide and conquer that you may have seen in other places. But what is important for us is that this upper bound, this quasi-polynomial upper bound for the problem says that when you want to show that the resolution proof of G is small, we cannot guarantee at the same time that it's tree-like because otherwise uh, we would be applying this al algorithm to refute the, the ETH. All right, so, so this is one positive result. Another positive result is you may wonder what happens about this divide and conquer. Can you extend it to general resolution? And it, it was proved that, in fact, you can extend it to some extent and you, to get a sub-exponential algorithm for general resolution. So now notice that if S is polynomial, so that means that you have polynomial size proofs, then this, this time is sub-exponential, so this is a non-trivial non upper bound. And in, this, in, the, in some sense, it puts limits on the efficiency of our reduction, and therefore it's very important information because, uh, okay, it says you cannot go beyond that if you assume the ETH. So, so far, these are positive results, putting limits on what we can prove for our hardness. So let's now talk about negative results. So what was known, uh, what was hard? And as we said, so strong proof systems here, uh, usually the proof search problem for stronger proof systems tends to be harder. And in fact, this was uh, the reason this was first proved. Krajicek and Pudlak showed that extended Frege, which is the strongest of the proof systems in the hierarchy I showed you, is not automatizable in polynomial time unless the RSA crypto system is broken by polynomial size circuits. So this was the first non-automatizability result. And notice that the assumption is a cryptographic assumption and it is very far from optimal in the sense that if you assume that RSA is broken, then uh, that doesn't mean anything about the automatizability of the proof system, right? So you cannot say that this is an if and only if. Now, this result was also extended to Frege and TC0 Frege and even to AC0 Frege, which is closer to closes to resolution, but it's still quite far from resolution and the assumptions were still crypto. So we're far from the resolution, uh, but there was this result that I mentioned already, Aleknovich Resdorov, where there was the first evidence that proof search for resolution has to be hard. And the evidence was relatively weak but still some evidence. It said that resolution is not automatizable in polynomial time unless a hypothesis in parameterized complexity fails. Now, one thing to notice is that this result says nothing about quasi-polynomial time automatizability, for example. So it doesn't say that even if you assume the exponential time hypothesis, it was recently noticed that the best that this proof can give is something like n to the log log n. So it doesn't say anything about sub-exponential time uh, and not even quasi-polynomial time. But the most worrying thing about this method is that it applies even to tree-like resolution. And we already know that tree-like resolution is, is uh, automatizable in quasi-polynomial time. So there is a good reason why the best you can get is n to the log log n, because n to the log n can be done right, for tree-like resolution. All right, so, so far about positive and negative results of uh, previous uh, works. So let's now talk a little bit about the new construction that we do. So remember what we want to do is to take an arbitrary formula and map it into another one, in such a way that satisfiable ones, formulas give you small proofs and unsatisfiable formulas gives you not small proofs. All right, so the construction of this uses this uh, concept uh, quite central in metamathematics, the so-called reflection principle for a proof system. 
And in the context of resolution and other propositional proof systems, this was studied by Cook in one of his other papers in, in 1970s. So what does it say? So basically, the reflection principle is the consistency or the soundness of the proof system. So look at this CNF formula. X. You have X, which is uh, encoding a CNF formula. You have Y, which is encoding a truth assignment for this formula. And Z, which is encoding a refutation of the formula X. And what this formula says is that X is both satisfiable and refutable, which is, of course, not possible. And therefore, the unsatisfiability of this CNF uh, is expressing the soundness of the proof system. Now, the formula G that we want is going to be half of this thing, uh, but this will come out later. So let me tell you a little bit uh, so you get an idea of how this formula looks like. Let's not read all these lines. Let's just look at the last line. So the variable Z i q b, for example, would be saying that the ith clause in the refutation contains the variable q with sign b. And the sign is just true or false for positive or negative, OK? And now the ref formula would say, for example, that the last clause is empty. So what does it mean that the last clause is empty, the ds is empty? Well, it means that all these z variables are all false. And that you can express it as clauses, of course. OK, so this is the usual thing that you do when you want to encode a, a non-deterministic computation into a CNF formula. And now it turned out that uh, people like Cook were asking how hard it is to prove uh, the reflection principle of such formulas, of such uh, of proof systems. And in the case of resolution, a long time ago, we realized that this can be done in polynomial size, not in resolution itself, but in a proof system that is slightly above it. So resolution, remember, it's working with clauses. And what we did is we could do it with a proof system that works with two DNFs. So it's just a little above. One DNFs are clauses, so two DNFs are enough to get refutations of this. So let me tell you a few words of how this works, because this is quite crucial. So we want to get a refutation of SAT and REF. So we start with the clauses of SAT, we start with the clauses of REF, and now we produce two DNFs that essentially what they say is that all the lines in the proof evaluate to true under the truth assignment Y. So look at the ith line here. This is a two DNF, or the first one. It's a two DNF that what it's saying is that Either there is a variable that appears positively in the first clause, and it is evaluated to true, or there is a variable that appears negatively in the first clause, and it is evaluated to false. So what it is saying is that Y satisfies the first clause in the refutation. And now, once you have this for one line, you can derive it for the next one, and the next one, and the next one by induction, until you derive it for the last one, but think of what the last one says. The last one says, we already said that it's saying that the empty clause, that the S is the empty clause. So what you get at the end is equivalent to the empty clause. So you get a refutation. Now this refutation has very nice structure. Look at the two DNFs. They mix Ys and Z, but they don't contain Xs. So one corollary we get is the half that we are after. Remember, if F is satisfiable, and we look at this formula G, where what we do is, instead of x, we plug the formula f. Then we get a small refutation. And the reason for that is that we can take the reflection principle restricted by f, restricted by the satisfying assignment of f, which we assume exists. And the restriction is going to be our formula g. And moreover, all the two DNFs become clauses now. The reason is that the y's are no longer variables. They are truth assignments, truth values. And therefore, this 2DNF becomes a 1DNF that's a close. Good, so we have one half. And uh, this was actually done in 2002. <laughs> so, so now the question is, can, how do we get the other half? And here I'm going to lie a little bit because we don't do it exactly for this formula, but the intuition is correct in, in the next slide. So this is the one slide proof of the lower bound. So what we want to show is that uh, our formula, so remember, so that's the lower bound, right? Assuming f is unsatisfiable, we want to see that there is no small refutation of the statement that says that f has a refutation, OK? So how do we do that? Well, on the left, we have the 
truth assignment, the, the symbolic truth assignment for a refutation of F. And on the right, we have a real truth assignment that states that is the exponentially long refutation of F, which exists because we're assuming F is, a, is unsatisfiable. And there is always an exponentially long refutation. Now what we're going to do is that we're going to show that these two, uh, so on the left we have the formula ref, and on the right we have a, a, a satisfied formula ref as well. So the one here you see, here at the bottom, it is satisfied by, because it, sorry, F is the CNF and P is its refutation, and therefore this is true. And on the left we have the formula that we want to show is hard. So what we actually show is that these two formulas are, or these two structures are a, indistinguishable by windows of width n. And so essentially what you have to imagine is that if you, if you only have a few pebbles that you can query, that you can mark in your refutation, then you can always transform them. You can always give them truth values to satisfy all the clauses of the formula. So, so this is basically the, the, what is behind the proof and to make it actually work, um, we have to apply random restriction, but uh, this is more technical and not really so important. So to finish, let's go back to the timeline. So we said we had this tension, and on one hand, we had the practical side that we're getting uh, easy proofs, uh, we're finding very big proofs. And on the uh, theoretical side, we're having evidence, but it was still a little weak, and we had to catch up, and now we catched up, and now we can say that in fact, the problem is as hard as it can be. So we have a tension here, we have a conflict. We have to somehow uh, resolve this, uh, but this is a task for another uh, occasion. So thank you very much. Okay. Any questions while the next speaker sets up? So what's the question? If, if it, so where do I use the fact that it's polynomial? Or? Well, let's come out. Why isn't a shorter reputation of F also indistinguishable from uh, the reputation for G? Uh, shorter than that? Well, you, you, need, you need some lower bound here. Because you, so you, want to, you want to be able to have uh, width n. So you need at least with n square in the in the left one. So you cannot get it. You cannot distinguish it from a smaller one. I, I mean, a smaller one would be distinguishable. I mean, maybe I'm not answering the yeah, right way. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe disconnect your. Okay, well, you could set up. Uh, yeah. Up, yeah. Disconnect your laptop. Well, uh, we can see if there are any other. If, if there's a quick question. But oh, okay. Oh, okay. So that's the Ramsey problem, the following Ramsey problem. So you want to know what is the largest n for which you can color the numbers one to n with two colors, zero and one, in such a way that every, that no Pythagorean triple, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, is monochromatic. What's the largest n for which you have a coloring so that no, no such thing is monochromatic. And what was shown is that for 1,500 some, something, you can always do it, but for the next one, you cannot do it. And ruling out all colorings of 1,500 numbers is, of course, 2 to the 1,500 numbers, so it's a huge search space, and we managed to do it. Okay, well, let's thank Albert again.